Good morning. I don't know if people can actually see my camera or my desktop. Hopefully, I've got somebody online and they can actually chat out and see what we're looking at right now. I think we're actually looking at my desktop, but I was hoping that we could actually show my 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 camera itself. So let's see if I can open up the browser and actually open up, chat out, and see what we're looking at right now. I think we're actually looking at my desktop, but I was hoping that we could actually show my 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 camera itself. So let's see if I can open up the browser and actually open up. Okay, so I actually had some echo. I have taken care of that, and it looks like we are seeing my screen. Um, I'm going to need to pause for a second, open up the YouTube link so I can actually see your chat windows, and actually turn that um, that microphone off in that window. So stand by for a second, and you're probably seeing me open up YouTube. And that's okay. I just realized that when I closed it to get rid of the sound, you were not going to be able, or you weren't able to chat. Okay. okay. I just realized that when I closed it to get rid of the. There we go. Okay. So now we're cooking with gas. Oops, I need that open. And. Okay, Hans Christensen, I see that you're out there. Sarah Vaughn, I see that you're out there. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks like there's 15 people watching me. Sorry about the rough start. Um, hopefully that you guys all actually saw the announcement that Power BI Premium is actually out there and available. So I was looking at a good friend of mine's Andrew Bruss article. If you hadn't seen it, I highly recommend that or Amir's white paper on Power BI Premium. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So my name is Charles Sterling. I actually do a series of webinars where I usually host them, not deliver them. But in this case, I'm actually at Focus, which is the user group summit next week in St. Louis. And I'm doing a presentation on how to design Power BI reports and dashboards. And I thought I would do a dry run for Sandy on the community. So that's what we're gonna go ahead and get started with, shall we? I'm gonna go ahead and advance the slide. There we go. Okay, so the first part that is worth talking about is we don't intend to do bad bad work. Um, and matter of fact, if I give you went out and gave you a list of these are the things that people commonly do and you should avoid, um, I'm sure the person that actually went out and did the analysis by school report didn't intend to actually go out and be a pattern of everything that you could do wrong. He was told ahead of time, hey, these are the things that you should avoid, and he still landed at that place. So I'm gonna give you some tips on how to not land at that place. So while the title of it is how to actually do um, great visually stunning reports in Power BI, I think the real title is probably at least best practices to not land at ugly. So that's, that's kind of where I actually wanna give the meme for this presentation. <coughs> okay. So before we get into design work itself, it's worth pointing out that the design work is probably the last 20%. Um, I've talked to a lot of a lot of BI practitioners, and while it's the, the place that we love to focus on, it's the place that we love to do the work, um, it's actually less than 20%, if 20%, of an overall BI effort. So what's the other 80%? A lot of that is actually getting your data and your data model in shape. Um, so going out and taking a look at your measures, your relationships, running the DAX, going out, doing the append, getting the dates and dates and dates in the right places is where you're going to spend a ton of your time. And then finally, when you've got all of your data in place, um, you're going to find out that some of the data that was just not good or doesn't work right. And you're going to have to go back out and clean that up. That it actually isn't so much about the modeling and the transformation. It's just the underlying data itself needs to be cleaned up. And then finally, after you're done going out and back, getting back to your stakeholders and making sure that it tells the story they need. So again, while we love focusing on the visualizations, the design aspects, it's a small percentage of the overall effort. Okay, so what are these, these rules or these best practices? Let's go ahead and dig in, shall we? So the, of the first 10, um, the first one is probably my favorite. And when we start talking about um, working with the designers, I actually met with four different designers here at Microsoft. Not BI practitioners, but designers of software. And the reason I started with these guys is there is very little, to, there's very little difference between a report and a dashboard as far as when you actually need to deliver it. It needs to go out and be compelling. It needs to be instructive. It needs to be immersive. It needs to be something that you wanted, you want to interact with. And of course, 
something that conveys the information. So I worked with, like I said, a couple different designers and they all start with a sketch. Um, now, two of those people were actually using PowerPoint. I'm gonna show you the tools on PowerPoint. One of them uses uh, Photoshop and one of them was actually using a tool called, uh, actually, no, I take it back. Wasn't using a tool, he's using pencil and paper. So shout out to Dave Culbertson, probably one of my favorite designers actually on the design team. Um, if you can't touch it, it doesn't, isn't tactical, tactile. I don't know if it's not real for him, but he actually does everything in paper. Um, you're gonna see it has some drawbacks and it also has some advantages when we get into it. Um, okay, the next thing that we do when we actually start thinking about drawing a sketch is we actually kind of lay out a, a commonality or a, um, an information architecture, if you will, of how we want to do the layout. Now, I'm not saying that this is the right and only layout. This is the one that my team uses for actually des designing Power BI reports. If you go out and look at Nancy Dowerts, I apologize, Nancy, if I'm getting your last name wrong. Uh, she does a great book called Slideology that even though it's a PowerPoint book, she talks about where your eyes track and where you want to have hero spots. And she talks about a reverse Z. Um, certainly one strategy that works. And again, but if you start out with, this is how we want our general layouts, and you follow that all the way through, you're gonna establish a rapport or a semantic relationship of where the information is to what it means when you actually start going out and giving more and more information. That's a very good thing. And we're gonna talk about more about that in colors too. Okay, so um, again, more information on how my team actually does layout or our reports, but let's go ahead and get into a demo, shall we? So um, <clears throat> this is probably, oops, I'm gonna go ahead and get into templates. This is probably one of the least known tools at Microsoft is the storyboarding add-in. Um, where is it? Storyboarding add-in um, for PowerPoint. It was actually done by my former team on the Visual Studio side of the house. And it gives you these shapes. So again, it's part of like the Visual Studio product. I have no idea what SKU you have to install to get it, but it comes with either Team Foundation Server or Visual Studio. And even though I'm showing you from within the storyboarding tool, Everything that we're doing in here, you could actually be done in just native PowerPoint. So using that um, that my, that meme or that map, if you will, that I just looked at, let's go ahead and get started. You probably want to do this with your stakeholders that you're designing the reports for. So I'm going to go ahead and say I want, you know, it, we always start with who are we building this for? Who is actually being represented? So I'm going to go ahead and insert maybe a picture. And I've got, I don't know, this boy picture. I like that one. So we'll put him up here. And by the way, if you see these girls and boys uh, motifs, is because the person we were, I was working with in the dynamics group um, was actually just having a baby. And we don't know the gender, so you'll actually see girls and boys in my motifs that I've got. Um, not saying they have to be blue and pink, it just that's what I chose. And now that I know who, let's start talking about what is the primary um, visual that I want to do. So I'm going to probably make my story around a map. And maybe going out and, and using a two-thirds, one-third breakdown and going out and having interesting things on my map. So um, I would talk to my stakeholders and say, hey, is this about right? And they're like, yes. But we also need to have maybe a distribution of the people in my map. Um, probably want to take a look at the volume of whatever it is that we're tracking. And go ahead and bring that over and across, see how we're actually doing. Um, and then probably go out and give you a comparison of that data itself. So this hopefully actually should kind of align back to that overall uh, map, if you will, of how you would do a layout. Now, we typically actually go out and do the breakdown of win. So I don't know if I have a good slider or a slicer, but I'm sure there is a control in here that actually here, a list would work just fine. So I can go ahead and do two lists to let me do breakdowns by win. And this actually is kind of how the customer team for Power BI starts doing a lot of our reports. And again, I happen to be using this storyboarding tool. Pencil paper works fine, Basomic would work fine, but start with a, a, a drawing or a storyboard or, or just some sort of something that you can start the conversation with your stakeholder. The other thing that is gonna be counter to the next three points I'm talking about, do not become invested in it. Be willing to throw this away. This is rough. This is something that you actually need to take inspiration from. 
but don't get invested. If you ever find yourself in, in defending a storyboard like this, you're probably in the wrong dynamic. You probably need to go ahead and say, hey, let's just start over and throw another one together. Because you saw, it only took me, I don't know, I didn't time it, maybe two minutes to get this template or this storyboard, sorry, not template, this storyboard together on what we're gonna actually gonna go ahead and start presenting on. Okay, so that was the first demo of how using Visual Studio boarding, storyboarding to show how you could actually do a rough draft of your report. Okay, so what's next? I mentioned the fact that the next three best practices are gonna be contrary to um, throwing your work away. Again, the idea is don't get mentally invested in any of these designs, um, but always, always use a grid. It's interesting that I would say that because this presentation came out six months before Microsoft introduced grids inside of the product. I'm going to show you that in a second, and I'm going to show you how we use grids before there were grids in the product. I know that seems like a, a misnomer, but I did say that right. Always use a grid even before there were grids available. Okay. The next one, um, always use the correct alignment. You're going to see that when I'm done with one of these drafts that we're going to get completed, um, the, the alignment and the spacing, which is number two, um, really stands out. It, it, it just catches your eye and it goes out and almost ruins the entire effect. Um, we're going to show you how you catch some of this in the end. But again, the um, using the, the layout itself is going to help you um, make sure that you've got the right spacing, you've got the right alignment. And finally, select the right background. This is how we're going to cheat. And this is actually um, sets you know, the look and feel for your overall presentation. So selecting the right background. Let's go ahead and do another demo on how you actually turn on the alignment, how to make sure you can get the right spacing, and much more importantly, using your background to cheat. So let's go ahead and we'll go back into our template2.powerpoint. And yes, we're going to make this available. And you'll see what I've done is starting with something like this, I've gone down and created a series of slides that look like this. Um, so again, the slides themselves are just boxes on a PowerPoint. And you'll see that there's even stuff that hangs over the edge because you won't see that. And getting back to who's being represented, what are you trying to tell them, and that layout that's going to give me the right spacing, that's going to give me the right alignment, um, and it's actually going to go ahead and set that grid up that we're talking about. How do you do that? So we go out and do File and choose Save As. In this case, you want it to not be a PowerPoint, but a PNG so it actually shapes correctly. And we'll call this one Sandy's Webinar. And we'll save it. It's going to ask me, do I want to save all of them or just this one? Now, what you'd want to do is actually do multiple different grid layouts for the different visuals that you're going to use and the different um, pages of that report. But in this case, we're going to go ahead and just do this one. And I should figure out where it just went. So that's going to be important to know where it went. It goes into something called documents design. So that's a good place to look. Now, what I can do is go ahead and go into one of these empty slides. Oh, sorry. I need to go and do uh, Power BI Desktop. And I've got a report open. And this report, maybe a lot of you have seen this, is the dashboard in a day slash dashboard in an hour that we use as kind of our, our primary uh, modeling tool, not modeling tool, our primary teaching tool. And here under view, you can see that we added show grid lines and snap objects to grid. <coughs> the way we're going to cheat is you actually not even going to need that. So actually this one here, ah, we'll I'll show it to you in a second. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the formatting trough, go to the page background, Choose Add Image, and we put it underneath a Documents, and under Documents, I think it was Design, and it was something called Sandy's, out oh, here, Sandy's Webinar. And it looks kind of a mess now, but I think if we clean this up, so we actually had our logo here already, um, our 
column chart isn't aligning just because it didn't know about that grid line. So we go ahead and resize that. Maybe in this case, uh, we're going to go ahead and put our donut chart over here next to our slicer. I love, I don't know why, but I love actually having donut or pie charts, which everybody hates over here on the left hand rail. And we typically, as a general convention, set our win slicers or our date slicers over again on this left hand rail. Now in this case, you're going to see that we're going to go need to go ahead and actually set the, oops, I need to highlight this, set the background so it matches with this color. Here we go. And maybe not so much that one, but let's go out and do one of the grays. And I actually choose the grays in my PowerPoint to match the, the, the palette that I'm using inside of, um, inside of my Power BI desktop. And we're going to get to palettes in a second. Okay, finally, we're going to go ahead and change my tree view to use this space and my map to use this. And resize this. And we'll resize this. Now, again, I only spent probably a couple minutes um, building this PowerPoint slide, and I would probably actually go down here and maybe even have another line chart or a spark line chart, giving more, more information. But I think you're gonna see that in four or five minutes, I've fundamentally changed the dynamic of this report to something that you do want to interact with. It draws you in. It has a different um, meme or a vibe from what it did a second ago. So let's go ahead and do file save as, and we'll call this one Sandy's. So that way I can actually upload it for people to look at after the fact. Um, back to slides, I think is where we're at. <clears throat> uh, use the right visualizations. So there is a lot of documentation. There are some great PDFs on if you've got this type of data, use this type of visualization. And I'm going to show this to you in a second. Um, what would be also interesting to note or something that you should keep in mind is think about the visualizations for your personas. So I haven't seen a graph for that. McGill Myers did a great job of creating one, but he's going out and saying that if you're going out and displaying something to, I, you know, my vice president is James Phillips. If I was actually displaying something to James Phillips and if I can get away with a pictograph where I could show him an image and he goes, I get it. And he doesn't need to drill into the data. Um, it's a win-win. He doesn't need to trial through a bunch of data to try to figure out what the story was. Um, I don't have to actually have that conversation with them and he gets that time back. Everybody's ahead of that game. If I can't do that, and pictographs are very, very hard, and if I couldn't do that, a dashboard that gives them the information that then, again, tells them that story is a good thing. If James is drilling through my reports and scorecards, I've probably failed. Um, something's gone off the rails. If he's going out and grabbing a dry erase and drawing my architecture diagram on my wall for me, yeah, something's not gone right there. Okay. Now, contrary to that, if I'm actually talking to, I don't know, Kamal or uh, Adam Wilson, I positively want them to look at my scorecard and figure out how I think my business is tracking, making sure that the metrics I'm driving, because metrics drive behavior, are the right metrics. If we agree on that, um, they probably don't even need to see the report. Um, so again, scorecards, how am I running my business? What metrics am I looking at? Reports, how did I come up with all those different metrics and how are they tracking? Um, same thing, if I can get away with a scorecard, ta-da, we win. If they are walking through volumes of reports and data, okay, I could, I could have done better, but it could have been worse. Um, analysts themselves, again, if I can get them to uh, use a a dashboard or a scorecard, a dashboard would be the primary vehicle that I'd like to actually have my analysts and my marketing people look at. Um, that's okay. If we follow it back to a scorecard, not the end of the world. Um, Miguel Martinez, my marketing person, looks at my scorecards all the time. And again, it's making sure that we're driving the right metrics. Um, luckily, I haven't actually fallen back into any of the reports I need to do to actually convey that message. And finally, I, it may seem kind of contrary. If I'm actually talking to customers, um, there probably is either end of the spectrum where they want, hey, just show me enough information to get your story across, or I really do want to know how it works underneath the covers. Therefore, I want all the dirty data um, or all the, the minutia. So 
thinking about your persona and the types of interactions or experiences um, is actually a good thing. So I promised actually showing you some of those um, tools for letting you look at data it would, with different visualizations. So let's go ahead and grab this PDF. Um, and this is actually probably one of the best tools I've seen. Here we go. And here we're going to go out and pull this over here. And hopefully um, you actually see where if you've got a relationship or a composition or a comparison or a distribution, you should use this. If you are actually going out and uh, looking at items, you should use this type of graphic and our visualization. So this extreme presentation um, is has done an amazing job. Um, kudos to these folks for actually giving us a flow chart of how to pick the right visualization. Now, I also like using, some have built a report for the sake of figuring out what visual you should use in a report. I know that seems kind of kind of redundant, but it's not. Um, actually, I have a link in it in my slides. Let's grab that. We'll probably save us both some time. Let's just copy that out. There we go. <clears throat> and just like that flow chart, it goes out and says, if you've got Y number of measures in X number of categories, um, you should use this visualization. So here's another tool on community.powerbi.com that helps you choose the visualization that you should choose. So if I go out and say I have one measure and one dimension, it will actually change um, the list of the visualization types that you should be using. Um, I love also on this one, the use of the chiclet um, visual as well. So if you haven't looked at the chiclet visual or don't even know about it, those other additional visuals can be found at visuals.powerbi.com. And you'll see that we're actually changing to the Office Store. So let's take a look at that one in a second. But if I go out and type in Chiclet, this actually will let you um, use images as the um, part of your graphic itself. And that's different than an infographic where the image becomes the visual. This actually has there where the uh, the buttons have become the uh, let's slow down. The image becomes the buttons, and I can go out and slice my data by those buttons using those visuals. So one of my favorite graphics is the chiclet visual. Um, and you can go ahead and do things like what this person's done right here. I don't even know who did this. Who did this? C-Funk. So you did a great job, C-Funk. Thank you very much. All right. Let's see if I had another visuals.powerbi extreme version. No. That's what I wanted to show you, was how do you get started with choosing your visuals by persona and letting your data influence what visual you use. Okay, which brings us up to the seventh point. So we're actually flying right along. Um, simpler is better. That kind of makes sense. Um, where if I can go out and remove the legend score, if it's not needed, if I can remove the grid lines on the background, score. Um, if I can go ahead and even go out and play with things like the um, negative space and actually have the visual take up the entire room, again, it makes it simpler. Now, negative space brings in an, another interesting facet on how you actually interact with it because you actually saw, let me actually go back. A second ago, you saw all this black. Now we're actually showing whites and grays. So we're not just influencing the negative space, but it's actually influencing the colors that we're interacting with, which brings me to the next point and one of my favorite topics. Actually, I said this, this was my favorite topic, and this is okay, um, which is the palettes and using the new themes in Power BI itself. So there are a ton of theory around colors and palettes and how do you choose them and how many colors that a person should use. And it's interesting, the palette will also dictate how many colors you get to use. So if you're using monochromatic, you can typically get away with more. Um, if you use tridatic, um, where it says that from the name that it was suggested it's three, it's actually only two. Um, one of the colors in a tridatic is actually just a, a trim. Um, if you look at these, these um, reports that I'm doing or these slides that I'm doing, you'll see that I'm using gray and black. 
don't really count. Those are actually more trim or supporting colors, if you will. Okay, so <clears throat> let how do you apply colors? How do you actually interact with colors? Hopefully, you guys saw my uh, guy in a cube video, but we'll go through a lot of that those same demos now. So, if I were to go ahead and um, go back to my dashboard, here it is. Um, and in the dashboard on the home menu, you see that there is actually a brand new option called switch theme. I can go ahead and say import theme. And I've got one called blue wherever we're at. Um, so if you take a look at the palettes that's used now um, and I choose open, what you should see after I hit close here is that the all the palette, um, all the, the, the colors in my visuals change to this particular palette. So if I go ahead and click on here and then click on the, um, the formatting trough and choose data colors and take a look at the palette, it's entirely different. I know I didn't show it to you before, but you get the idea. Now, um, how do I, how did I create that or what, what was in that palette that I just looked at a second ago? So if I go back into my design, find one of these palettes in there, dot JSON, here's a pink one, so I'll open this one up. And you'll see that uh, their, their hex values for defining the colors in an XML document or a, a JSON document, which is a formatted um, XML document. So this is actually those pinks that we're actually looking at. And this was the one, one of the ones that Amanda created. And I'll show you where I found that or where I download this one in a couple minutes. Um, <clears throat> so how did Amanda do this? Now, Amanda, I think, actually used Notepad to create hers but there are clearly easier ways than Notepad. So if I go back into Chrome and go to a good friend of mine's uh, website, powerbi.tips. Oh, looks like I spelled it wrong somehow. And I go out and take a look at the color theme generator. And he's got two. He's actually got one that looks like a wheel and actually one that is a grid. Um, and let's go ahead and launch it. Let's see if we can actually find the link to launch the color. Here it is. Um, and what I can do here is we'll call this one Sandy's theme. And I click in here and I can go ahead and choose the colors I want. So I'm gonna choose this yellowy. And since I called it Sandy, I'm gonna go ahead and continue on this motif of sand color pictures and maybe up way up here in this gold. And you get the idea that I, I now are selecting mine and I can go ahead and say download color theme. And even though it's called Sandy's theme, the file name is actually gonna get changed to Power BI Tips Colors. And I think that put it in downloads. So let's go ahead and go back to the Sandy's theme, go back to switch theme and go out and choose import theme go to downloads and I think it's that one is the sandy theme and those are all the sandy colors that we just chose very very sandy looking obviously we'd want to have our our template that we created in PowerPoint match these so there's gonna be some back and forth here to create the right the right views and the, the right looks the right template using the right palette um, additionally um, I actually worked with Peter to create one for power, a color generator or a power color palette generator as well. The primary difference is, is where I actually can choose all the colors with um, Michael Carlos from Power BI Tips who created that one. Uh, the one I created uh, called Theme Master. Theme Master 500. By the way, the Theme Master 500 is named after my barbecue I had in Australia. Um, go ahead and select the color theme tool. And you only choose one color here. And what it does is it goes out and uses the different strategies to give you the um, complementary colors that you would want to actually have from that one color. So it's saying if I actually chose this yellow, like this sandy color, I can go ahead and influence which yellows, but it's going to go ahead and build it off of that one that I chose. Additionally, um, I have some presets to go out and say, I want this really, really um, uh bright sandy palette if you will so i can go ahead and choose apply that's going to save it and that's called chuck theme seven so let's go ahead and go back in here say switch theme import theme and find chuck theme seven and you should see that 
kind of fairly similar. Um, and again, the idea is, is if you are color challenged like me, all you have to do is color, choose one color and the tool that I help write actually will go ahead and select the rest of the colors for your palette. Okay, so where are we at? Um, oh, the Adobe tool. The Adobe tool is awesome. Let me make sure and show that one as well. The reason I love the Adobe tool is because it goes out and says, if you're actually using this rule, this is what your colors are going to look like. Now, you can't export this to um, a Power BI theme because they don't have an accessibility model, but it certainly lets you go out and take a look at the theory behind it in a visual way. Um, one thing I, I thought was kind of strange is that um, it gives you the same number of colors. It would be great if they could constrain the number of colors as well to a series of best practices. Um, Try it also has the idea of these trim or these supporting, and I'm guessing that that's what these two should have been, um, but it doesn't really tell you that. So again, maybe I can reach out to my friends in the Adobe land and I can actually write a tool that actually exports into this to a Power BI theme. That would be pretty cool. Okay. Back to my slides. I think we're actually almost done with the presentation, so that's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and bring it up. Oh, so now that we've actually got our report looking pretty good, you should go ahead and enhance key areas. Now, me and Sandy agreed that in this one, the black just pops. It's what drew our eyes is those blacks, this needle here and these arrows. How do you find that out? How do you know what pops, what brings your eye to it? Um, I love Lukash's suggestion. Lukash is one of the guys on, on the team that does some of the prettiest reports that we've got. Um, his trick is pretty simple. Take your laptop, open it on one end of a conference table, walk to the other end, and look at it from 12, 15 feet away. You won't be able to see the text, but that's exactly the point. Um, it forces you to start doing uh, semantic um uh, correlation between your colors and it actually goes out and uses shapes to figure out whether or not you're doing it in a good and a bad way and you can see that if that information is coming forward and you really see that when you're further away by the way I think I may have missed a part of this slide so ah, sorry about going back guys I apologize here we go so um, yeah I did miss this because uh, I wasn't in a slide view so when you're looking at your colors Remember I talked about having a semantic model for your shape and your colors. Um, additional suggestions for, for colors, don't have more than three or five, three to five colors, um, if you can possibly do it, on your report. And also, the type of uh, color theme that you use, a color strategy, as Adobe calls a color rule, should also dictate how many colors. If you do want to have six colors, you should probably use monochromatic, not triadic. Um, also, this gets back into that monochromatic and having six colors. Um, most people's eyes actually can't even differentiate more than five colors of the same hue. So reduce the number of colors. It gets back to the so simple is good and having semantic models for both shapes and colors is good. When I talk about shapes, maybe having a, um, a column chart that builds up to a certain reflection point and then goes back down or continues up, but call out that reflection point, have everything maybe on the left being one shape or one shade and having everything on the right on another. Okay, <clears throat> so enhancing parts of your page, using color, using shape, using size, using layout. The easiest way to do that is proximity away from your report. Um, and again, I want to get back to the very, very first thing I talked about is drawing a picture or a storyboard of what it is that you're going to deliver and not getting invested in a particular look or feel. If you get to this point and you are defending what it needs to be, you're still at the wrong place. You probably should need to go out and say, okay, let's make a copy. We'll start over. We'll go through the, the same steps and we'll see if we land in the same place. If we land in different places, Hopefully, it's not a lot of t um, invested time thrown away, but you're going to find that the end result is probably going to be better. So with that, that's the 10 steps on how to create better looking reports or how not to create junk in my parlance. Um, 
may not give you visually stunning reports, at least not a, 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 a initially, but it's gonna certainly put you on the right path. My name is Charles Sterling. I wanna thank Sandy for having me on today's webinar. And I'm gonna go ahead and see if there's any questions because I actually left the question pane a little while ago. Um, okay, so I've got Ashok saying hi to Hans. Say hey, hey Hans and Ashok. Uh, what is Power BI Premium is what Ashok is asking. So um, there's lots and lots of articles on it. Net, net, net is that you can go out and buy this Power BI Premium and go out and share your reports with your stakeholders, even though it may have used Power BI Pro features, they don't have to buy a license because you actually bought this premium capacity. Um, so that's the new, as Seth saying, it's the new license that was just announced today. Say, thanks, Seth. Um, and here's today's blog about Power BI Premium. Oh, cool. So um, I've actually chatted that back out. And it looks like that is the end of the question. So if there's another questions, um, oh, Seth said he couldn't post the, the link into this chat window. Um, I have found the same thing as that if you have anything that looks like HTML, Google goes out and uh, blacklists that because it thinks that you're going to be doing cross-site scripting. So I found that to be the case as well. Uh, simplifying the URLs actually work for me. All right. Uh, with no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and bring today's webinar to the close. And... Uh, we have no webinars next week because it's billed here in town, and I am actually flying out to St. Louis to actually deliver this in a 90-minute version. We're actually going to drill into more of the hands-on aspects, um, but the same number of slides. With that, I want to thank everybody for joining us, and you guys have a great day.